I would like to start by thanking for the invitation to attend the ISA Midwest. Unfortunately, due to the travel ban into the US, it has not been possible for me to plan to attend in person. I'm very grateful to the organizers for allowing me an opportunity to give a recorded presentation. And I'm even more relieved to hear that the US travel ban has now been eased, so that it will be possible for me and many others to attend the 2022 annual meeting in Nashville. I hope to have a chance to see at least some of you there in person. The um, topic of my presentation today is the question of whether democracy is in decline. Now you might think that democracy is primarily an issue about domestic politics and institution, but whether countries are democratic and how public opinion may influence foreign policy is something that plays a key role in many theories about international conflict and cooperation. I'm fairly confident that many papers on this conference, for example, will include democracy in some form in either the theory or as a control. As such, the topic of whether democracy is in decline is more than just a descriptive question about individual countries. The answer has fundamental importance for our outlook on future of global relations. So, in this presentation, I will try to do three things. First, I will express some skepticism about whether democracy actually is in decline. And second, I will try to explain why it is that so many people clearly believe that democracy is declining or are afraid that it will decline. Third, I want to underscore that being skeptical about whether we have a declining trend does not mean that democracy does not face serious challenges. It certainly does, and they merit our attention. But I will try to show that most of the challenges cannot by any meaningful standard be considered new or recent trends towards the decline in democracy. Rather, they involve enduring problems that have been with us for some time and are likely to be with us for some time in the future. Finally, I will argue that it's very important to get the diagnosis right, especially since Many have made predictions about the state and future of democracy that have been spectacularly wrong in the past, and they've offered arguments about causes and prescriptions that have been very problematic. Now, let us start by first examining the case for why democracy often is perceived to be in decline. The concerns here are actually quite diverse. On the one hand, we have cases where reform processes and aspiration for democracy have been rolled back after the fall of a dictator with Egypt after the Arab Spring as a um, prominent example. So in this case we have uh, a decline before transition to democracy have actually occurred. We also have other countries where democracy has been unstable in the past and is now under threat from leaders seeking to expand their executive powers with Turkey as a possible example. And finally, and, and perhaps more paradoxically, we also have a widespread perception that democracy is threatened in many uh, democracies that have been to be well established in the West, either under the threat of right-wing populism or an erosion of individual commitments to democracy. This particular sense of decline is underscored by many recent books with alarmist titles, such as Levitsky and Ziblatt's 2018 book, How Democracies Die. There are also several global data sources that claim to document the decline in democracy. So Freedom House, for instance, in their 2021 report, uh, says that democracy is under siege. Um, and the VDEM uh, data project at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden have also published a series of annual reports with similar titles, emphasizing that democracy is in retreat or, or facing global challenges. The case for democracy being in decline is sometimes held to be backed up by data. So as good empirical social scientists, we should try to look at what these data actually show. We have many efforts to measure democratic institutions based on different criteria, uh, one of which is the so-called polity data. This figure shows the proportion of countries falling into different categories in the new polity 5 data. The green line shows the proportion of countries considered to be democracies. 
One of the first things that we note from this figure is that these data do not appear to indicate a clear recent decline. We see a marked increase in the proportion of countries considered democracies from the late 1970s. This peaks around uh, 2000, but there's no obvious decline since then. Now, this counts all countries equally. If you weigh countries by population size or take into account the share of people living in colonies, then we will get different previous uh, waves of apparent uh, increase or decline in democracy. But we still see a clear increase since the 1970s, even with different weighting measure. And there's no weighting scheme that I'm aware of that would produce a clear decline in global levels. Now, of course, there are other data sources, such as the varieties of democracy data that we mentioned. But if we look into the VDEM data in more detail, then we also do not see a clear decline in global average of democracy. Figure 2 uh, shows the global averages for the VDEM's project's five main democracy indicators. And the most striking feature here is that the figure overall actually looks quite similar to the quality data that we saw previously. Only one of the five indices um, in the VDEM project appears to display any noticeable decline, that is the Deliberative Democracy Index in pink, but even here the decline is modest. Upon inspection of the VDEM data <clears throat> and the reports produced on declining democracy, uh, it becomes clear that much of the case for declining democracy turns out to stem from perceived negative changes in a few countries such as the US, India and Turkey. These are admittedly large countries, but it's still noteworthy that these changes by themselves do not generate major changes in the global average. Let's take a look at the data on the US in the VDEM data and what they appear to show in terms of a decline in democracy. The graph on the left here shows change in the liberal democracy values for the US compared to the 10-year average. The figure is taken from an op-ed article by VDEM researchers in the Washington Post, which uh, underscored the retreat of democracy in the US. And for comparison, we have the absolute values on the indices on the figure to the right. So we can see here that there's a general upward movement in the index values, but we see dips around 9-11 and uh, the Bush presidency, and then a particularly large decline after Trump becomes president in the US in 2016. I'll have more to say about the US later, but in order to understand where these data come from, we first need to look at the underlying methodology used to produce the VDEM data. The VDEM data are based on what we call expert surveys. Um, in short, we ask individuals with some expertise on a subject to score different questions or indicators, and then we can combine these in measurement models for the underlying concept, in this case, democracy. Expert surveys is a common methodology, and it can obviously be useful for many purposes. But as always, the results will hinge on the inputs that we use. Experts can make errors too, and they may have a host of personal views that will influence their ratings. If the biases or experts are diverse, then they will cancel out when we aggregate. But that is not the case if experts have common biases and antipathies. So it seems fair to ask if the decline for some countries in expert surveys could reflect something about the view of the experts. Rather than institutions actually changing in the US, perhaps what is declining is rather the experts perception of the quality of democracy in the US. This could be the case because many experts have strong antipathies uh, to Trump. And in addition, since 2016, experts and the rest of us have seen a great deal of news and statements that we may dislike during the Trump administration. And this could well influence our perception, even if we haven't had any clear institutional changes per se. Now, we may certainly dislike Trump for many reasons. But by most definition, democracy is ultimately something else than whether we like leaders or their policies. So to determine whether democracy declines, we would need to anchor this in some explicit definition of democracy.
there are many definitions of democracy, but there are a couple of elements that are common to many of them. One is a competitive election. Popper, for instance, he defines democracy as a system where we can actually remove leaders in elections. Or we could focus on institutions that provide some kind of check and balance on executive power. By these criteria, have we really seen a clear shift towards less competitive election or institutional change in the US? Now, <clears throat> we may think of the election college in the US as a problematic institution insofar as someone like Trump could become elected without winning the popular vote. But the Electoral College has not changed and people have been elected without winning the popular vote in the past. We have similar if less extreme examples from other countries and electoral system. So in the UK for instance it can often be the case that a party could increase its share of members in the parliament even if the vote share declined. And uh, there are also mathematical proofs that it's impossible to have perfect representation and that all uh, system outcomes will generate uh, um, representation that seems to defy popular vote. Trump uh, indeed used a large number of executive orders to bypass the legislature, but so are many other US presidents in the past. Obama, for example, notably claimed the Paris Agreement as a non-treaty in order to avoid seeking approval from a skeptical legislature. And uh, Biden has enacted more executive orders than Trump in his first 100 days. Admittedly, some data sources such as the Vietnam Project take a more encompassing view of democracy beyond institutions, including what they call deliberative democracy. But I think it's also fair to ask if deliberative democracy is so much worse now than it has been in the past. To name some examples, we had racial segregation in much of the US until the mid-1960s, the Watergate scandal in the 70s, and then in the 1980s, Reagan singled out the government as the problem and called for people to wrestle power from the elites. To illustrate more general problems with expert surveys, I'd like to take a brief detour to another important Swedish research project, namely Hans Rosling's Gapminder. In addition to collecting data and methods for visualizing change and development, the late Swedish physician and statistician Rosling um, started the so-called Ignorance Project to investigate what the public know and don't know about basic global patterns and macro trends, especially in health and uh, development. This project included a series of factual questions on issues such as current global average life expectancy, and the change in the share of the world's population living in extreme poverty over the last 20 years. The results are documented in his book Factfulness and they should give us pause on what can go wrong in surveys. In short, the answers that people give tend to be far more pessimistic about outcomes than the data on the actual state in the world. For instance, most respondents believe that current average life expectancy must be much lower than the actual 70 years. And most people think that poverty has been rising over the last 20 years, even though it actually has halved. Now you might argue that this is just what the lay public thinks, and if you ask experts, then surely they would do much better. But the survey has been conducted in many countries and different populations, including students, uh, NGO workers, and even Nobel Prize laureates. Rosling actually found that presumed experts, such as NGO workers and people with university ed education, tended to do even worse than the lay pub public. Indeed, in this case, <clears throat> the respondents all do consistently worse than a random guess, or the share of correct responses that we would expect if they submitted by the proverbial chimpanzee dropping darts at the scoreboard. This happens because we have a systematic negativity bias where people are drawn towards negative ratings. And I think to this we can add um, a recency bias where people often long for some mythical past where things were better than they are at the present. This should give us pause for considering potential problems in expert surveys. If experts have problems rating accurately trends in health and development, why should we believe that they could address trends in democratic institutions? Now, <clears throat> why people tend to think that things are bad and getting worse in health and development 
is outside my own area's expertise, but we clearly know that these biases exist. But uh, one issue that I worked on myself is belief about trends in conflict, and here I think we have similar evidence of negativity and recency biases. So let's unpack what we can learn about the sources here. With regards to expert ratings of conflict, we have the so-called Doomsday Clock, published by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. This is now set to 100 seconds to midnight, the lowest point ever. It's also very clear that the public perceives conflict to be very prevalent and becoming more widespread. We may not have many interstate wars, but surveys consistently show that people believe that the problem of civil wars and terrorism is getting worse. Now for nuclear warfare, we only deal with estimates of events. I personally think it's unlikely that the risk of uh, nuclear war is higher now than during the Cuban Missile Crisis, but there's no way to compare my estimate with that of the atomic bullet scientists because we don't have a clear ground truth. But for trends in conflict, we now have long uh, data series and research about trends, and I think we can say a lot more. The figure here, in the bottom right corner shows the number of battle deaths in civil war. Although the conflict in Syria is very severe, we actually have fewer deaths now than we did before the end of the Cold War, and even with the increase from the Syrian civil war, we've had a decline in battle deaths since 2014. So at least for measured by the number of battle deaths, there's no evidence that the problem of civil war is getting worse. If that's the case, why do people believe that things are getting worse? This is to a large extent because our information is drawn from the news cycle, and the news cycle has known biases. We hear about horrible things happening, and any event such as war and violence will always be headline news. But the front page will be biased towards negative events. Something becoming less horrible is just not going to be front page material, and many cases where we've had improvements or decline are just not likely to get attention. In addition to the biases from news media, we sometimes have a tendency to accentuate the negative in order to draw attention to issues and avoid complacency. For example, a 2018 report by the UN and the World Bank claimed the conflict was surging and escalating, and it did so in order to advocate for more investment in conflict prevention. My own view is that this report went out of its way to interpret the existing data in an alarmist fashion, and it relied on measures such as number of conflicts rather than severity, in part because it wanted to launch a strong call for action. But if our goal is effective conflict prevention, then alarmism is unlikely to be helpful. It's precisely the cases where we see less violence that are likely to be the most useful to understand what could work to limit conflict and enhance peace. The uh, problem of bias for media events has an important and instructive parallel in measures of human rights and what we can conclude about the effectiveness of human rights treaties. Christopher Ferris, for example, in an important article, has shown that we likely know more about current human rights abuses than what we do in the past, and we therefore tend to underestimate improvements in human rights and the effectiveness in human rights treaties. So this is not just an arcane measurement issue, it makes a real difference to our substantive conclusions. Although I don't think that there is a trend towards a clear decline in democracy at the present, that is not to say that democracy does not face plausible challenges. But I think the issues that generate attention now typically reflect problems that are enduring and not by any measure new challenges. So first, as we talked about, democracy can face challenges for incumbents who seek to expand their power at the expense of other institutions, but try to push through constitutional changes. Now, we may think that this is problematic, but it can hardly be called a recent trend. Second, it's also true that some might make heroic assumptions about individual voters and their capabilities as citizens. There are many empirical studies suggesting that voters are generally unconcerned about democracy and tend to resemble Homer Simpson more than Homer Economicus when it comes to information and rational decision making. And it's also true that popular approval for democracy and values that we see as central 
um, maybe more shallow than often assumed, but it's hard to say that this is a new phenomenon. If we look at actual data on service satisfaction with democracy, then we don't find very clear evidence of a recent decline. The levels are essentially flat over time, and there's little evidence that alternatives to democracy are becoming more popular. On the left here, we have a um, um, global data series from the World Value Survey on satisfaction with democracy. And if there's any trend here, it seems to um, involve a decline at the start of financial crisis, predating Trump and the current perceived decline in democracy. We know that government dissatisfaction with the regime is likely to be higher during economic crisis, and this may well spill in over into how people evaluate democracy itself. And indeed, we see a similar impact of the mild recession in the early 2000s. Social choice theories tell us that there's a tension between majority rule and political institution. To make the dynamic more concrete, we can stabilize particular policies by submitting to institutions that are hard to change, such as EU standards or fiscal constraints. But if we make it too difficult for people to challenge policy, then we risk generating a backlash. Democratic governance requires difficult decisions about how we should weigh individual rights, political competition, agreement for procedures, and room for stability versus change. These are difficult issues to get right, but they're not new challenges by any measure. It's very important to get the diagnosis on the challenges that democracy faces right. If we don't, then we risk a misplaced nostalgia for some kind of pre-decline stage of democracy, which in my view is no better defined than the question of when America was at its peak greatness. Previous waves of pessimism over democracy have led to very problematic policy prescription. There's a great deal of concern with polarization at the present, but in 1950, uh, APSA convened a special report on the state of the American party system, which worried about precisely the opposite. The APSA report noted with dismay the excessive convergence between the major parties, and it called for sharply increased divergence so the electorate could be offered the clear political choices that were deemed essential for democracy. Likewise, many luminaries on democracy and transition, such as Hans Pinkton and Dahl, confidently asserted before the third wave um, that it was very unlikely that we would see much expansion in democracy, especially not in communist regimes in Eastern Europe. A book by Jean-François Revel in 1985 prophesized the Western democracies would perish under competition from an expansivist Soviet Union since the West lacked the determination to contain the Soviet Union. But in retrospect, it seems fair to conclude that the, exactly the opposite has happened. So clearly there's a long history of democratic hypochondria and pessimism about the future of democracy. Um, in 1993, the Council of Europe held a conference at my home institution, the University of Essex on disillusionment of democracy. And I think this underscores how this topic has been with us for a long time. The wrong diagnosis about the problems democracy faces is unhelpful since it distracts attention from what may matter both in terms of making democracy resilient and what we can realistically influence. This is obviously a very big topic that I cannot fully cover here. But I'll focus briefly on what I see as the underappreciated role of protest and democracy. The traditional view exposed by Huntington and many others was that democracy was something that should be left to elites and only introduced cautiously to prevent chaos. Even more liberal theorists such as Dole argued that democracy was unlikely to result from social upheaval. Still, many of the transitions that we saw in the late 1980s, such as East Germany, did indeed follow large-scale popular uprising. In more recent work, I've shown that we're substantially more likely to see transition to democracy following protest in autocracies. And um, I also think that the link cannot just be reduced to reverse causality, where we see uh, more protests before weak regimes fall. Um, if we look at plausible instruments for protest, then we still find an effect on transition. Now, of course, we have a potential adverse election problem, such as uh, countries um, 
with protest embarking on democratic reform, may face additional challenges that make democracy difficult, and we're more likely to see a reversal when we have democratization under difficult circumstances. But I still think the protest is likely to be the, an important avenue for democratization in the future, and it may also play an important role in keeping reform processes on track once started. In Poland, for example, we've seen uh, protests over efforts to reduce the independence of the judiciary. Um, in 2020, um, we had a constitutional crisis in Peru, where the outcome was strongly influenced by protest. Protest helped spur the resignation of members of a controversial new government, and it eventually led to the fall of the government altogether. So to conclude, <clears throat> I think it's clear that democracy faces many challenges, but I also think that the patient is not as sick as many argue. Claims about the imminent demise of democracy have been wrong in the past, and so we shouldn't simply prepare for the inexorable death of democracy this time either. As an empirical social scientist, I strongly believe in the value of data. But we should keep in mind that data are attempts to measure the world rather than the world itself. And we should be aware of the potential pitfalls in the data that we examine. In an important chapter um, by Jervis entitled Cumulation, Correlation and Woosel, um, Jervis recounts the story of Winnie the Pooh and Piglet thinking they're on the track of an ever-growing number of woosels when they're oblivious to the fact that they're actually following their own tracks and they're simply walking in circles. I don't think debating whether democracy is in decline is a woosel in the sense that the issues pointed out do not exist or that the topic is not worth studying. But still I think it's useful to ask if our work might be chasing woosels in order to pose the right questions and try to learn more from them. So in this case, we should be mindful of what is presented as evidence for declining democracy. We should try to scrutinize the potential problems in that evidence and also consider what this may leave out. For example, I think it's a mistake to simply accept the evidence for trends in the data from expert surveys if we don't always also consider their potential biases. We need to examine whether the problems that are flagged now may also have existed in the past, even if we may know less about these than we do about the present, given our attention to the new cycle. Not doing so will lead to bad history. And in order to understand the present, we need to be able to compare in a meaningful manner with the past. Moreover, we shouldn't just be wary of the problem of wrong diagnosis, but we should try to understand why people arrived at them in the first place. When predictions are wrong, it's often especially useful to try to understand where they came from. And by focusing on things that have gone better than we expected, we might end up learning something about important causal relationship. In my previous work, I've argued that we could use the decline of conflict to learn about the causes of peace. And I think a similar approach can help us learn much about the challenges to democracy, why democracy has been more resilient than often feared, as well as trends and plausible scenarios for the future. So to draw to a close, I want to emphasize that you may or may not agree with my skepticism about whether democracy in decline, but I hope that I have at least provided some food for thought and debate, and I wish you all the best for the rest of the conference. Thank you.